you can do better than that. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I give myself away. Now, some of you are thinking, I'll give myself away after I dress up. I want, I want to take a shower and put some perfume and wear some nice clothes and bowl my hair, whatever it is. You give yourself as you are. He'll clean you up. I said, you give yourself as you are. Amen. The good, the bad, and the ugly. He can handle it. I said, he can handle it. How many of you are happy he can handle, he can handle you? I have a thought in my mind. I'm gonna, uh, it's been, I've been thinking about it the past couple of days. And so in the news, this whole week, uh, it seems everyone's talking about AI. How many of you wave at me? AI. It's short for artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence, okay? These computers are made in such a way they, they think. And, they, and, and, and if you have a phone, uh, I use my phone a lot, Siri, I've got to be careful, you'll stop talking to me. Uh, for all kinds of stuff, you know, you ask anything to tell you, right? Artificial intelligence, and this, is, this has really tripped me this week. So there was, uh, in the news, there was um, if evidently someone had created a, a voice of, of a, someone's daughter. Have you, how many of you heard that? Someone's daughter. And it was an imitation. It was a fake voice. But it was the daughter with the same vocabulary, the same tone, the same everything that, quote, called the dad crying. It wasn't really her. It was fake. Crying, dad, dad, dad. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You pay the ransom, pay the ransom. And the dad was just, said, that's my daughter. I recognize her cry, I recognize her tone, I recognize her voice. And he was ready to write a check. And then finally they found her. She was really uh, uh, safe someplace else. And um, the, these, these things can imitate uh, voices and it's, they sound smart. Let me tell you something. The devil is the original AI. I said the devil's original artificial intelligence. He'll, he'll, he'll sound convincing. He has, he's a smooth operator. He knows how to use the voice and, and the tone. And sometimes he comes, he comes sounding like the Holy Spirit. Almost like God telling you to do something wacky. The devil's a liar. I said the devil's a liar. AI, AI. And I was, I was thinking about this. That I, I said, I need, I need to work on a sermon, but I, I'm not going to preach it today. But, you know, in Joshua chapter 7, you see Ai. Ai was a small town. And the children of Israel had entered the promised land, had a great conquest over Jericho, big leagues. Now they had a little town, Ai. But somehow Ai convinced them that they were an easy target. And they believed the fourth the false voices. So Joshua and the children of Israel attack AI uh, w without all their, all their stuff. And they lost. And the reason they lost is because there was hidden sin. Hidden sin among the ranks. You know, AI, the voice of AI will tell you, hey, listen, it's a little sin. It's okay. God loves you. You could go ahead, don't worry. Just, just, tell, just have a, a little, little tear on Sunday morning, but you don't have to repent. You could go back to that thing or that person. And that's a lie of the devil. I said it's a lie of the devil. This morning, I, I, I use my phone and I say, and I, and I try this. I, I got to be careful because it'll talk to me. You haven't done that. You, you say something that sounds like Jerry. And I said, Jerry, uh, 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 is Jesus Christ God? And giving you an answer. The answer was kind of many people believe, most Christians believe that he is God. He is the incarnation of And when you read it, it sounds, it sounds legit, but it didn't say he is. It's, it's, it's just many people, many Christians believe he is. It couldn't say it, Jesus is Lord. That's how you know. I'll share one scripture and let you greet one another. Here's the scripture. 1 Corinthians 12.3. No one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord 
except by the Holy Spirit. And the devil, AI, no one can really say Jesus is Lord unless it's by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Today, we have a house filled with people saying, can you say together with me, Jesus is Lord? One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. Come on, say it again. Jesus is Lord. One more time. Jesus is Lord. And next time the devil whispers into your lie and trying to convince you of something that is false, just cancel him. I love that word cancel in a, in a good way. Cancel him out by saying, Jesus is Lord. Amen. Would you find two or three people and let them know, Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Good morning, church. So good to see you this morning. So good to have you in the house of the Lord together. I uh, want to encourage you this morning, if you're a first-time guest, we say, welcome to Flag. So great to have you today. If you would do something for us, uh, if you could take the Connect card out uh, from the back seat pocket there and fill that out, or there's a QR code on the screen, take a picture of that. It gives us a record of your attendance, and we just say welcome to Flag this morning. Also on the back of the Connect card, uh, as always, you know, there's are prayer request cards uh, that you can... Put your prayer request, praise report, uh, connect card, prayer request card. Just place those in the black box as you leave this morning. So we prepare ourselves to give. There, there are various ways you can give. You can give by text. You can give online. Again, we have the black boxes at the back for you to drop uh, your, your, his tithe and your offering in. I want to share a passage of scripture this morning uh, and just a quick thought. Uh, in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, we're told that we should follow God's example. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, we should follow God's example just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Now think of what happened when Jesus gave, not only on the cross but in, in life. You know, Jesus didn't give just once. He just didn't give on the cross. His whole life he gave. Uh, he gave himself to us, he came from heaven and gave himself. But also we see in his life that wherever he went, he taught, he fed, he healed, he freed people from Satan's power. His life was marked by giving. And just as Jesus blessed others uh, with the way he gave, people are blessed when you give. People are blessed when you give. And the Lord who commissioned us to carry, the Lord has commissioned us to carry out that same mission of giving of being like Christ, of where we go, we should be givers, we should be generous. And I appreciate you guys. You're such a generous congregation. What I want to leave you with this thought is that may, you may never open the eyes of a blind person, but because you give, spiritually blind people get to see Jesus clearly. You know, you may never raise the dead, but because you give, people are coming alive in Jesus. Your giving makes a difference. Your giving matters. I encourage you today to be like Jesus, to be a giver, not only uh, with your finances, but with your time and your talent and everything that you have, that you would be a giver and that we would be like Christ. Let's bow our heads and let's pray this morning. Lord, we come to you today. And Lord, we thank you that Jesus gave, that he gave of himself, Lord, that that he chose to come to this earth and, and sacrifice his life. But, Lord, as we study his life, Lord, we see that he, he was continuously giving, giving of himself, that he was blessing others, that he was providing and, and making a way. And so, Lord, we're, we're commissioned as his followers to do the same thing. And so today, Lord, we, we give. We give. And, Lord, we thank you for the blessings on our life. And, Lord, we thank you that as we give, that as, as we are Christ-like, Lord, we know that lives are going to be changed. And so, Lord, this morning, we just thank you for the gift and the giver. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. In your copy of God's Word, would you turn to John chapter 21. We're reading verses 1 through 5. John chapter 21. 1, verses 1 through 5. This morning I'd like to recognize some friends of my wife and I. Um, Greg and Deborah Perhoda, amen. Good to see you, friends of ours. 
for many, many years, many of you know her ministry, uh, she's ministered here. Oftentimes, they were longtime pastors at the Embassy Church Assembly of God in Rosenberg. And last year, uh, she retired from that assignment, but she serves on our district-level presbytery, which means that she's probably busier now than she was as a pastor, amen, of helping uh, our several hundred churches in, in the Assumption of God, amen. We recognize and we appreciate them being here today. And any other visitors who are here today, we pray that we pray that you are impressed not by the church, not by me, please, but that you are impressed by Jesus Christ this morning. John chapter 21, verses 1 through 5, if you have it, say amen. amen. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Sea of Galilee. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Verse 5. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? And they answered him, No. This morning, for the next few moments, I want to preach to on the subject, breakfast with Jesus, breakfast with Jesus. And a sermon that I think every preacher in America has preached and preached m multiple times as a passage. But I, you know, something about the Word of God, it never wears out. You can preach from the same passage over and over and again, and it's too fresh. It's too fresh. And I believe God has a word for somebody here this morning. Father, we pray that your spirit may continue to move in our midst. Father, I pray that you may... Grant your servant an anointing to deliver your word that no flesh may glory. Father, I pray right now that our hearts will be receptive to the word of God. Move, continue to move by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. So this passage, you have to understand the background. It takes place after Easter. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ and before he went to heaven in the ascension. And we know from scripture that Jesus showed himself alive for 40 days, and, for 40 days before the ascension. The disciples had already seen him, the resurrected Christ. Jesus had told his disciples to meet him at a familiar mountain in Galilee. Go uptown to Galilee and meet him on a mountain where he would appear to them again and give them what you and I know, the Great, com the great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. In Matthew 28, 16, just listen to this. The Bible tells us that the eleven went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed to them. So they're on a the mountain waiting for Jesus to show up. Suddenly Peter gets restless. Peter gets restless. And he announces there to his buddies, I am going fishing. So he walks away from the mountain, and six other disciples follow him, and he goes back to the sea. He had just been through a lot. The recent past was traumatic and traumatic. He had been to the Hosanna Parade, the Last Supper, the betrayal of Judas, Gethsemane, a sword fight the crucifixion, his denial, hiding out in the house, experiencing the resurrected Christ. Up and down, a lot of emotions. And even though Jesus had raised from the dead, Easter was over. 
It wasn't the big crowd anymore. We didn't have the big choir on the stage anymore. And all the special events, now it's back to the normal life. And I'm just tired. See, Peter had a habit that he was into himself. Even now, you would think after the resurrected Christ, he was into himself. It was only after he got filled with the Holy Ghost that he was able to move on. So he announces, I'm going fishing. Here, he was still preoccupied with self, still managed by his mood swings. So Peter decides to go back to the familiar, back to the familiar sea, back to the familiar boat, back to the familiar net, back to the familiar profession, back to his familiar lifestyle. Interesting, he went back to this very same place, the very same address, the very same waters where Jesus had first encountered him three years earlier. When Jesus showed up and said, can I borrow your boat after they have been fishing all night and caught nothing? Very similar. And Jesus takes the boat, preaches, and then tells, tells Peter three years earlier, go launch into the deep. How many of you remember that? Launch into the deep. Don't do the shallow. Go launch into the deep. And Peter said, hey, listen, you don't fish in deep ocean, you, you fish in shallow waters, and you fish at nighttime, not in the daytime. But at your word, I will go. He went, you know the story, he caught a lot of fish. And it was after that that Jesus told Peter, three years earlier, in the same place, the same address, hey, Peter, you have been a fisher of, a fisher of fish, but from now on, I'm calling you to be a fisher of men. And the Bible says they left everything and followed Jesus. But he came back to his boat. I was reading this, and, the, and one, one commentary was saying that in this passage that I just read in John, that they went and got the boat. The boat, meaning it was his boat. It wasn't a boat they borrowed. It was his boat. That means he never gave up his boat three years earlier. He put his own boat in storage just in case. And three years later, he got his boat back. And he went back fishing. The Bible tells us in verse 3, but that night they caught nothing. The familiar had disappointed Peter. His comfort zone did not comfort him anymore. I don't know. Maybe when they took the boat out that night, after they walk away from the mountain, they did probably what you and I often do. You make your own decision, then you do a prayer over it. Let's just pray with two or three. Let's, let's go in agreement. I know Jesus said stay in the mountain, but let's agree. Let's cancel out what Jesus told us with another prayer. That kingdom come, that will be done on earth, that sentence in heaven. Let's go. Oh, I feel good about it. We do it all the time. Come on. We know what God has told us. But then we try, to, we try to cancel God with our own prayer, and we find two or three to an agreement. Then we feel good about it because it feels good when people agree with you. I mean, I feel wonderful when people agree with me. It doesn't mean we are in agreement. It just means they're yes people. So he prayed. Then went fishing, caught nothing. Then after that, they're coming back in to shore. And Jesus appears, they don't recognize him. It's interesting. The resurrected, resurrected Christ appeared to people, but only when he revealed himself was he recognized. He, every time he would show up, he had to let people know who he was. He had to reveal himself. He shows up from a distance. He says, children, friends, have you any food? And they answer him, I, 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 when I read this, I hear an attitude. Peter, fisherman, have you caught any food? And I could see him saying, no. Don't rub it in, no. 
When Jesus asked, asked that question, he was basically saying, hey, has the familiar comfort zone resulted in you being any better off? It forced Peter to admit that the familiar had failed him. Hey, there's nothing wrong with fishing. Some of you love to fish. I don't fish. Uh, that's, not, that's not my gifting. But some of you love to fish, deep sea fishing, you love it. Okay? I hear it's wonderful, but you won't see me in a boat. I don't even eat, eat seafood. But I hear it's a noble profession. It is a respectable profession. But it was not what Jesus had called Peter to do. He had called Peter to be a fisher of men. Use all your skills, all your talent, Peter, that you have learned as a fisherman and use them now to fish for men. He went back from fishing men back to fishing fish. Listen carefully. Once God's call is upon your life, you can't go back. If God has called you to do something, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. You can't shake it off. You can't wash it off. You can't cancel it. When God has called you, it's in your spiritual DNA. Whether you're 12 years old or 22 or 42, it's in your spiritual DNA. I remember a time when, when, in my 30 when I quit the ministry because I was burned out after 13 years of church planting in New York City. And I quit. I don't want to preach anymore. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of dealing with church drama and church people and politics and, and sheep that bite. I quit the ministry. And I remember thinking, I'll, I'll continue to serve Jesus. I'll be a good worker in the church. I'll be a good board member. Now, I remember that I, I quit for the first time. I've been a full-time since I was 18. Quit. My, I had a friend that had a condo in Miami Beach. I went to Miami Beach to seek sun and to veg, and then I went back, got a secular job. I got in a nice condo in Westchester County. I was going to serve God my own way, but I was miserable, miserable. You know why? Because I had a call upon my life. It was like fire shut him in my bones. I had to preach. Verse 6, John 21, verse 6. And Jesus said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of all of the multitude of fish. Now, I've heard many people preach this, and, they, 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 and this is fine. Why did Jesus tell them to cast the nets on the right side? Oh, because they were casting in the wrong side. Ha, ha, ha. But as I was studying this, the Lord gave me a revelation. Okay, they were casting it. Jesus told them to follow me. Jesus said, cast the net on your right side. Why? Because they were casting the net on the left side. Now, that's not a big revelation. Okay, that's, not, that, that's common sense, right? They have been casting it on the left side rather than the right side. Now, here it is. Why? Most people are right-handed. If you're left-handed, raise your hand. Raise your right hand. I'm just testing you. I'm playing with you. Okay. All of you that are right-handed, raise your right hand. Okay. If you had something with your right hand. Hold your right hand up. I'm going to show you something. Imagine you're holding a bag, okay, a bag, and you're, you're in a boat facing the front, and there's two sides. That's the right side and the left side. You're holding a bag. It's a little heavy, okay? It's heavy. Act like it's heavy. Hold your arm up. It's heavy, okay? You need to throw it over the side. Throw it. Do it again. Heavy. Throw it. Most of you are going to throw it on the left side. If it's heavy, you can throw something. The reason that Jesus said, 
throw the net on the right side. He was saying, you've been using your dominant hand. You've been using your strength. You've been using the familiar. You've been using your muscle. But I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to use not your dominant hand, but I'm going to ask you to use your weaker arm. And I'm going to ask you to cast those nets using your weaker left hand. And when you cast it, cast it on the right side. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, folks, I'm here to remind you, sometimes God is going to ask you, don't use your strength. Don't use your familiarity. Don't use your skill set. Don't use what you're comfortable with. Use your weakness. Use your left hand. Use your non-dominant. Why? Because you don't need him. He doesn't need your muscle. He needs your obedience. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I hear the apostle Paul saying, oh, God told me that my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And this morning, God is telling somebody, my strength is made perfect in your left hand. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Paul continues and says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities or in my weaknesses that the power, the power, the power of God may rest upon me. For when I am weak, when I use my weakness, he is strong. Cast your net on the right side. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Many years ago, and I've shared this often, my wife and I were newly married. I had spent many years in ministry in New York City. Then subsequent to that, many years as a crusade director for various international ministries. That was my strength. And after that, God called me back to pastoring. And my wife and I newly married. Something I knew that God had called me that, but I didn't want to pastor until God brought me a godly wife. I didn't want to be a single pastor, and God brought me a godly wife. Now, we were ready to pastor, and I was young. I knew it all, okay? I, I thought I knew it all, and I remembered we had worked, uh, I had worked prior to that with a, as a crusade director for in, international events with Nikki Cruz, and he wanted me to relocate to Colorado Springs, well, he's been living there for 50, 60 years. And I, I, I used to travel there a lot to meet with him. I work out of my remote, out of my townhouse in Dallas. And he had offered me to move close to help me build a house, get settled in Colorado Springs. And God told me, don't leave Texas. I've called you to pastor a church. So I told my wife and I, we're ready to pastor. But then I showed God my strength. I showed God my muscle. I showed God my resume in case he didn't realize that I worked for many international evangelists. And I, and, and I told God, God, I humbly make myself available to pastor a mega church. You didn't hear that. I humbly make myself available to pastor a mega church. Because, hey, I'm, I'm talented, I'm smart. I have a resume. My wife was raised in church. We, we, you, know, you know, I've earned it. Look at my right hand. Look at my muscle. Look at my, my, look at my experience. Look at my endorsements. I make a church in a big city. Because I know the city. I know city. I know city. I was raised in New York City. I know city. I'm like, I, I, I got my degree in urban anthropology from New York University. I know city, the ins and outs. And man, I got it. I got it. Man, we're going to. And God laughed. <laughs> <laughs> and God told me, cast your net on the right side. In other words, use your weakness. And God led us to pastor a church. In a little country town in deep East Texas. Deep East Texas. I had pastored, I had lived in Tyler, but this was a town called Crockett, Texas. Small. In the middle of nowhere. How many of you know what Crockett, Texas is? Okay, good for you. (laughs) 
We're talking about in the middle of nowhere. It was the count in the middle of nowhere. And God, when, when God sent me there, I said, oh, I'm open-minded. And I, my wife was working at the time. My wife is, was, uh, uh, was a brain nurse working in Methodist Hospital in Dallas. And I went to spy out the land. And I went to Crockett, Texas, drove there two and, two and a half hours. And I drove around the loop. They had a loop. They had a loop. <laughs> they did. And I'm on my wife, on my phone, talking to Rebecca, saying, hey, Rebecca, this is a cute town. It's cute. It's very normal, Norman Rockwell-ish. Really, really cute. I mean, I'm driving around. And say, oh, they have a really nice Western rustic-themed restaurant called the Wooden Nickel. What's it? The Wooden Nickel. It looked very something you would see in Austin. Very cool. Wooden Nickel. Okay? And I'm, it's really cute. Oh, man, we can eat there. And if God brings us here. And I'm driving around the loop. And yeah, 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 talking to my wife, talking to my wife. And then after five minutes... About five, six minutes later, I'm, I'm talking to Rebecca and saying, hey, Rebecca, hey, this place is happening. They have two wooden, wooden nickels. <laughs> then I realized I drove by the same one again. I had done the whole loop in five minutes. And God sent us there. For the first time in my ministry, I could not use my resume and my bags of tricks and my experience, because I had no idea how to pastor a, a country church. God, I, I, I told people, I, I could have done better in Uganda or any other country than Crockett, because it was so foreign. And why did God send me there? To punish me? No, to prune me, to purge me, so that I could learn that I don't need, God does not need my muscle. He needs my obedience. And he was there. I said, Lord, I mean, I remember we, we planned a pot-blessed meal. And I was Mr. Excel sheet. Everyone sign up. What are you going to bring? I will make sure we have enough meat and enough potatoes. And it was when I, we did that, and they, they, they said to me, don't worry, we don't do a list here. You don't do a list? No, we, we just show up with food. And they showed up with food, and there was more than enough food. Without Mr. Organized Crusade Director, I learned there to rely on the Holy Spirit. I learned there that I did not pastor a, ch- a congregation. I was pastoring a town. I had to rely on my weakness so that God can anoint my weakness to rely, that God, to rely on his anointing, his presence, and his power. See, sometimes God loves you so much that he, uh, he'll ask you to do something outside your comfort zone so that you can trust him. So that when God uses you in a place away from your comfort zone, everyone will know it had to be God. <laughs> it had to be God. But there's no way she could have done that. There's no way he could have done that. Casting it on the right side. Okay, I got a two amens. I, I continue with verses 7 through 12. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord, because they caught a lot of fish. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. I always thought, why did he put on clothes to go swimming? And then I realized this was important. He knew that when he came out of the water, he wanted to present himself with reverence and respect and modesty. So he came prepared to stand before the Lord, modest, wet but modest. You know, hey, God, God rather see you dressed up and wet than showing your skin. Amen. I said it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. We have some, anyways. <laughs> I used to travel and go to places and and people dress with. Swim clothes, you know, or sportswear, and then don't look at me, look at Jesus, and you, you couldn't help. Amen. So he was modest. Okay, I said it. You're one of those pastors? Yes, I am. Verse 8. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits dragging the net, of, the net with fish. Verse 9. 
And I'm going to circle back in verse 9. Then as soon as they came to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Verse 12, and Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. I want to stop right there. Come and eat breakfast. Come and eat breakfast. Come and eat breakfast. They saw in verse 9 a fire of coals, fish laid on it, and bread. They saw three things that represented three ingredients that Jesus wanted them to have in their life that he was presented to them in their spiritual, in the spiritual breakfast table. That he was inviting them to dine. He was saying, okay, I've asked you to use your weak hand to cast on the right hand. Now, we're going to have breakfast. Breakfast. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Some of you came to church without eating breakfast, and you were doing fine, but now you... And I've learned when I was young, I would leave the house without drinking breakfast and go to college. And after about, after one class, then I would grab something to eat. But as I got older, I realized I need breakfast. I need energy. I'd rather have a, a healthy breakfast and, and have a very light lunch than skip breakfast. Some of you are looking at me like, you know you're wrong, right? Oh, I had a donut. That's not breakfast. That's not breakfast. Eating a healthy breakfast, starting the day with Jesus with breakfast. And then Jesus that was there with three things. Three things. First, first thing you see, there's fire. 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 Fire represents power, represents the Holy Spirit. You cannot do anything without fire. You cannot do anything without the Holy Spirit. You need fire. John the Baptist said when he first saw Jesus three and a half years earlier, he announced, he, he announced, Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Hallelujah. Fire represents power. It represents purging. It represents the enabling. Before Jesus went to heaven, he told the disciples there, there outside Jerusalem, you shall receive power. Hallelujah. During the day of Pentecost, the Bible says there appeared to them, to the 120 in the upper room, divided tongues or flames as a fire. And they separated, the flame separated and came to rest upon each person. They were baptized with fire. Hallelujah. I was raised in the church, and we will sing a song that said, it's the Holy Ghost and fire, and it's keeping me alive. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you, one day, the Lord is coming back in a white horse with eyes of fire. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Fire. You need fire. You need the Holy Ghost. To do what you have to do. You can't do anything without the fire, without the power of the Holy Spirit. But when I was reading this, it was interesting. It said fire, coals of fire. And I realized, well, what about coals? You can't ignore the coal. The coals, the hot coals, reminds me of Isaiah. When the Bible says, Isaiah said that one day he saw, king, when King Uzziah died, he saw an angel with a hot coal from the altar, and he touched his mouth, and he burned the mouth of Isaiah and said, go and tell the people. He's anointed his mouth with fire, which is how we preach with fire and authority. When you preach, not just me, all of us, when we preach the gospel, you need fire. Not clever spiel, clever talk, and cliches and things that rhyme. That may work for a season. But when you preach with authority, when you preach with fire, it brands people, not with your words, but with the word of God. Hallelujah. There was fire. The second ingredient there is fish. Fish speaks of provision. The very resource 
they were working hard to acquire. They had worked all night to get fish. And Jesus was making breakfast with fish. You ever wonder where the fish came from? Jesus said, bring your fish. But he had fish in a frying pan already. Oh, my wife was like, and she said, oh, nothing like fried fish. I don't do fried fish. But I hear it's good for some people, fish and chips. And I don't know where those fish came from. Jesus couldn't have said, fish, and fish pop on a, on, a, on, a, on a pan. I don't know. Or fish, come now. And the fish jump out of the, they're like, boom, 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 boom. You say, I don't know how he did it. It doesn't matter. He could do whatever he wants. Here he was, frying fish. It was his way of reminding Peter and the other six disciples, I've called you not to be fisher of fish. I have called you to be fishers of men. In other words, Jesus was saying to them, you fish for men, and I'll provide the fish for your plate. Oh, I'll say that again. You fish for men, and I'll supply the fish for your plate. You do what I've called you to do, and I'll take care of you. I'll supply all your needs according to my riches and glory. Hallelujah. In other words, you catch the fish, I'll clean them. I love that because my job is to be a fish of men. My job is not to evangelize and then clean people up. My job is to preach the word of God and let the Holy Spirit clean them. My musicians, would you come as I close? Third element, bread. Bread speaks of promise. It speaks of the intimate, life-giving fellowship with Jesus. Just listen to these two verses. John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. In John 6, 6, 51, he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Bread. As I read that, I thought about another story. When Jesus rose from the dead the Easter Sunday, Easter Sunday morning, and last week I preached how he showed, he, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, okay? And he appeared to, to the disciples that were hiding out in the, in the house. But there's another incident that happened that same day. The Bible says two disciples, probably not one of the 11, but two other followers were 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 busted and disgusted. They were leaving Jerusalem and headed towards Emmaus, seven miles away. They were just dejected and rejected. They were just depressed that Jesus had, had been crucified, and that was it. The Bible says, oh, it's a great story. The resurrected Christ shows up and starts walking with them, and they don't recognize him. And he starts talking to them, why are you so depressed? Are you the only one here in Jerusalem that don't know about Jesus Christ? We thought he was going to come and deliver us from a Roman Empire and establish a country again and, and be our Messiah. And they're talking to Jesus. They don't, recon- they don't recognize him. Follow me. They don't recognize him until something happens. They don't recognize him. He's walking with them. And then Jesus starts teaching them from the word. He starts teaching them from the prophets, from from the prophets in, in, in the Old Testament. The living word was using the written word to reveal himself. He's talking about the prophets and how the, the prophecy said Jesus would come and so forth and so on. They arrive someplace and 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 they park and Jesus is going to continue and say, no, 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 we like you. There's something about you, something warm and fuzzy in us. I'm not making this up. There's something warm in our heart about you. Stay, stay. Because they had been presented the written word, and they were sensing the living word. We want you to stay here. 
At that point, oh, this is the great story. They sit down, and Jesus begins to serve them bread. Now, keep in mind, Jesus is the guest. It should have been the two disciples walking to Emmaus that should have been serving, right? But Jesus turns the table. Where he gets the bread, I don't know. And the Bible says he takes the bread, he breaks it, bread, third element, breaks it, and gives them the bread. When they take the bread from the living bread, they take the bread, their eyes were opened. And they realize it's Jesus, and he disappears. And they say, oh, we should have known when we were walking with the, with the living word of God, we felt it. We felt it. And when he sat here with us, there was something special. But when we receive and fellowship with him, when we communion, had communion with the living Jesus, our eyes were opened. Folks, you are blind. You cannot see well until you are in fellowship with Jesus. When you're not in fellowship with Jesus, you can't see clearly. You can't. I have reading classes. In my, I buy them from Amazon. I buy them like 10 in a pack. I have them everywhere in my house. I can't read anything without my... How many of you are like that? You have reading glasses. Okay. I raised my hand. Some of you, you can't even see I raised my hand. How many fingers do I have up? It's almost like when you have not been in fellowship, Jesus is your reading glasses. It's almost as if when you're having had breakfast with Jesus, you have having fellowship with Jesus, you haven't received from the bread, you can't see clearly. You shouldn't be driving. Oh, my goodness. You shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be signing contracts. You shouldn't be giving signature. You shouldn't be using the phone because you can't see. Jesus gives you clarity of eyes. Would you stand? Jesus. Bread speaks of promise. Here's the point. Don't be nourished and find fulfillment by any other bread. Don't find fulfillment by the familiar fishing career. Don't find fulfillment by the familiar places of your past, your familiar comfort zones. He loves you so much that he will cause those familiar things to become empty nets in order to redirect your call. Jesus said in verse 12, come and eat breakfast with me. Dine with me. As a pastor, I have to make sure that I'm dining with Jesus. I got I to gotta make sure as a pastor, I'm sharing for myself to, to help you because you, sometimes people think that you're a pastor, you have it all together. No, I don't. As a pastor, it's easy for me to find my comfort not in the Word of God, but in ministry activity, in busyness, in having fellowship with people that I like. And then people I don't like, I try to schedule them as far down as I can. Don't be offended. I could, I could get, I could get, feel good about keeping busy, having a project, what's the next big thing? Oh, we're going to have VBS. Let's get, let me get involved with the VBS energy. We need, we need workers. We need props. We need this. We need, I could get caught up with the energy of producing an event. 
I could get caught up by the energy of attending an event where a lot of my friends attend. And I feel nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying they're sin. But the danger is when I substitute those breads for the bread of life. In fact, I could get, and I think if you're, if you're a preacher, you will know that, I, I could get energized working on a sermon. I love working on sermon, studying in Greek. But the danger with that is God wants me to read the Word of God for me. Not to come up with a sermon series. Do you see what I'm saying? All those familiar things, nothing wrong with them. But there's no substitute at feeding my soul with the bread of life. We sang a song earlier, Give Myself Away. Jesus could have wrote that song. I have given myself away. And he wants you not just to like him, like a Facebook like. And not just to embrace him, but he wants you to ingest him. That's why we take Holy Communion. He gave himself to us. Fill me with Jesus. The more Jesus you have in you, the less of you you have in you. And your biggest headache, your biggest problem, I'm going to identify. Your biggest headache, your biggest problem Look in the mirror. It's you. Not demons. Not legion. It's you. You are your worst headache. So he wants to fill you with Jesus so that there's less of you. You are in Christ. Christ is in you. You died to self. He gave, his, he gave himself away. It is not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. So that when you're serving him, you're full of the Holy Spirit. Our church, we're filled with wonderful people. You're all wonderful people. Some of you are very talented. You do well in your careers. Energy corridor, medical, whatever it is, in your business, whatever it is. You may be a phenomenal homemaker. You do it well. But be careful, you're relying on your own muscle. And sometimes God loves you so much. This is down in my notes. But sometimes God loves you so much, he will unplug your world. Unplug your world. Blackout. Unplug your world. No generator in the house. Unplug your world. So that you can realize, without you, I can't do anything. I need you. Oh, I need you. He does it not to punish you, but to purge you. Sometimes he does that so that instead of you depending on DoorDash, you come to him and he'll provide you a breakfast that DoorDash can't provide. Sometimes we allow our success, our resume, our muscle, our accolades, our trophy case. Oh, look at my trophy case. As if you could take it to heaven. You cannot take your trophy case to heaven, folks. You enjoy it now. You can't take it to heaven. You cannot take your trophy case. The only thing you could take to heaven are other souls that you brought into the kingdom of God. That's it. He heaven doesn't need your trophies. It doesn't need more gold or silver. What heaven wants more is more souls. That's why he has us here to bring more souls. But he doesn't, he is not, God is not impressed with your trophy case. He's not, I said this the other day, he's not impressed with your gifts. I can sing, I can preach, I can prophesy, I can interpret, I can cast out demons. God is not impressed with your gifts. Why would God be impressed with something he gave you? He gives you gifts, you give him fruit. What is fruit? Christ-likeness. Less of me, more of him. Jesus was having breakfast with Peter and saying, Peter, Peter, Peter. Less of you, more of me. Eat breakfast with me. You need fire. You need the Holy Ghost and fire. Peter, get back to your assignment. Fisher of men, 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 not bass and, and not catfish, men. And Peter, feed of me. 
and let's after Peter surrendered, after Peter got filled with the Holy Ghost, he was a different Peter. Oh, the Peter of the of Acts was a whole different Peter. A different Peter goes to a temple. And lame man is there. Give me alms, give me alms, and give me alms. And Peter did not give him a dime. Peter did not give him his resume. Peter did not give him uh, his spiel. Peter did not give him a fishing rod, whatever. Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, but such as I have I give thee. He had the such. Oh, my goodness. And he, he was a whole different person. Every head bowed, every eye closed. This morning, Pastor Cortez, I am not right with God. First, I'm not right with God. I am not right with Jesus. And I want to give myself to him 100% this morning. I repent of my sins. And I want, want him to be Lord and Savior. If that's you, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I got to do this. Raise your hand quickly. Is there anybody here? Amen. Amen. This young man, praise the Lord. You can put your hand down. This morning you're saying, I love God. And in many ways I've loved God. But I've been trusting my resume, trusting my muscle, trust, trusting my, my, my trophy case more than him. I'm trusting more in the familiar than in Christ. And I'm in danger of making the familiar an idol. And I don't want that. If that's you, you want to realign your walk with the Lord. You're loving the Lord, but you want to realign your walk with the Lord. Would you, would you raise your hand? Anyone? Yes, yes. There's a few of you. Hallelujah. You can put your hands down. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to pray. This young man, have you ever given your life to the Lord? Come up here. Pastor Noah, this is Clay, that's your son. How old are you? 18. 18. Yes, sir. I like it. By giving your life to the Lord at 18, my goodness, he has you covered. You'll never be the same. I, I've been watching you. The Holy Spirit's been working you. He's been knocking on your door. Amen. I know much about it. I know your dad. I know your family. But I, I think you know what God is doing. 18 years old. Eight, how many of you wish you were 18? How many of you, you wish you would have given your life to the Lord at 18? You would have saved yourself a lot of headache and a lot of money. You stand behind him and those who, all right, you can help pray. Amen. I just, I'm excited. 18 year old. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we pray for this young man. Father, you have been knocking on this door, he has a sensitive heart. Lord, he has strength and gifts and talents that he's now wanting to surrender to you. He's giving his, uh, himself away. He's giving himself away. Lord, to someone that loves him like no one else. Lord, he has a mom, he has a dad, he has family to love him. But no one loves him more than Jesus. Father, I just pray that you're blessing being upon his life. Father, I pray that you will use him and guide him. That he will have breakfast with Jesus every day. And Father, I pray for every person here today, Lord. All of us. All of us, Father. That our walk with Jesus won't be just a religious habit. But that our walk with Jesus will be real. That we will be in step with him listening to his words at all time, filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, we want the real thing. And Father, for those that have a call upon 
a call of God upon their lives, Father, I pray that we may not substitute the call with the familiar. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here who has substituted the call for the familiar, Lord, unplug their world so they could be right with you. Lord, our time on earth is limited. We're here on earth for a reason. And you're the reason. I pray a blessing upon each person here today. Continue to move by your spirit. In Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to say a blessing on your way out. Greet one another. Men, if, we could, if you could help Pastor Brock in the lobby to prepare for the... For the uh, baby shower this afternoon that will be appreciated. Father, we thank you for the move of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the resurrected Christ. Be with us in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said amen and amen. God bless you.